Hey everybody, Quantum here, and in this video I wanted to go ahead and break down the Emerald Amethyst deck type for set 4 Ursula's Return. This is an aggro focused deck that is a little bit more straightforward than other more complicated decks you might see in the metagame right now, and it definitely is a meta contending deck, doing very well into things like Ruby Amethyst and Ruby Sapphire, so if those decks are very prevalent in your metagame, this is definitely a deck to consider. This was a deck that also countered those kind of decks in set 3 into the Inklands metagame, but people thought that this deck would have really fallen off with the prevalence of Steel, mainly the emerald steel and while it can struggle into that matchup you definitely have some tools in order to combat that um you know bucky discard mechanic um but you will still struggle against like amber steel song and potentially sapphire steel if those are prevalent threats in your metagame so uh option to consider if you're looking for something to play for your store set championships let's go ahead and jump straight in so for your one drops um you probably want to play something like 10 to 12 one drops because you are you know an aggro focused deck and so seeing something on one is very very important the two chernobog followers here can be magic brooms technically but i do think the chernobog followers is just a little bit better because you don't need to play the character to banish it you can just say okay i'm going to quest with it and the two one body can also help you trade things out in you know later parts in the game or early game if you need to the Pegasus um, is the one drop that you play here be over like something like Diablo, simply because um, you do play the Shift Pegasus in this version. Like that has more or less been cut from the Emerald Steel version, but in the Aggro version, I think the Pegasus does represent great value because you do want to keep questing as much as possible and you focus a little bit less on the control aspect. <clears throat> but having a 1-1 evasive is very strong as well uh, just to get early questing pressure in. We, we all know how strong Pascal has been in the past and, you know, um, the Pegasus continues to kind of do that. Your best one drop, though, will continue to be Cursed Merfolk, simply because it comes down as a, you know, two-questing body that discards when it's challenged. Your opponent will likely um, try their best to out it without challenging if they if it's possible. Mainly only the Steel decks can, can more or less do that. Like, if your opponent wastes a Brawl or something on this, that's actually not bad for you. Um, so at worst, this card goes one for one, usually. Um, the only time it doesn't is if, you know, they go first and they play Cinderella and then you play this on turn one and they sing Let the Storm Rage On and that feels really bad. But other than that, this is always usually going to be a positive interaction for you. And if you do get the lore off of this before it's it's gone, um, that's just you know free value off of the Curse Merfolk. So it continues to be one of the best cards in the in the deck. And you know, just a quick side note: Do you remember when I was telling you guys in my market watches that you know with this card being under a dollar, it was definitely worth grabbing extra copies even. And isn't it going for like five dollars now? It's kind of crazy, eh? Um, moving on to the two drop slot, we got the Flynn Riders here, the classic from set one. And we're also opting for Ursula Deceiver. So Ursula Deceiver, while it's not an aggro-oriented card, um, I think similar to what Jordan Moore did in Chicago when he came second place with this deck in the Disney Lorcana Challenge, um, you, you'd still need some ways to counter your counters, right? So like if your opponent's sitting on a grab your swords and you think they might be playing it the next turn, you might want to drop this as your next play in order to rip the song out of their hand. Um, so this card gives you good counterplay to protect your board. That's how you want to use this. You don't want to just like drop this blindly on two usually unless you have no other two drop. Um, but this card does represent good value in protecting your board, using it as a counterplay option. And then the Flynn Rider is just your aggro quester, of course. And then, you know, it threatens to discard, obviously, when it's challenged. Again, another weak card. So it is outed by a lot of the Steel songs, which is, again, why Steel gives these aggro decks some trouble. And to round out the two drop slot, we are playing four Madam Mim Snake still. Uh, you have insanely powerful synergy with bouncing like Ursula and then replaying it too to just rip apart your opponent's hand if they're on a, a song heavy build. So while I say like Amber Steel Song is a hard matchup for this deck, depending on how the, the flow of the match goes and the tempo and stuff, like you can definitely just like rip apart their hand and take away any of their like non challenging sources of removal and some of their options for card advantage, right? With like Let the Storm Rage on, a whole new world being ripped out of their hand. So because you play this combination of the Mim cards to bounce, you definitely get some extra value there. But the Mim card is also just a big body that will quest obviously and it can do things like protect your cursed merfolk so after you've quested with merfolk bounce it back to hand and replay it in a ready state so that it can't get challenged you can get another two lore off of it hopefully in the three drop slot i've opted for two jock and two kick cloud kicker we all know how powerful sisu emboldened or not emboldened uh, empowered sibling is the new eight drop that banishes all two or less strength characters um and kick cloud kicker can help you well, it is targeting, so it doesn't deal with Cogsworth, but it can help slow down your opponent's board. This can bounce back an opposing Diablo, so that if you had card draw, you can use it without worrying about your opponent drawing. Um, and it just bounces other things back to slow down the tempo. In other, you know, Emerald matchups too, it can bounce back the Ursula Deceiver of all. 
Um, so yeah, just a very good card. In matchups where it's not useful, let's say against Ruby Sapphire, you just ink it. So it is a very low risk card to play. The Jock also represents some good value here. It's a two quester, that's a one four body. It only costs three, and again, it's inkable if it's not immediately useful with its effect. But its effect is when you play it, you can force an opponent's character to have Reckless. So think about an opposing Diablo. You can like drop this, force the Diablo to have Reckless. You know, if you have a Mim Snake on board from the turn before, you quest with your Mim uh, Snake. Now you're, the opposing Diablo has to run into the Mim Snake, right? Um, if the opponent doesn't have a song to out the Mim Snake, that means their Diablo is going to get banished when it challenges the Snake. So on Curve, you have a lot of nice little ways to deal with certain threats. Um, also, you know, like a Beast Tragic Hero on the Steel side, if you drop this, force the Beast to have Reckless, make it run into something so it takes damage and turns off their draw engine. Use it on like a Tamatoa so it can't quest and get back an item. Use it on a Hiram so it can't quest and draw. Like there's a lot of utility with this card to help slow your opponent down. So these cards are definitely tempo oriented cards that you want to use in certain scenarios in order to stop the opponent's game plan to a certain degree. So these are your tempo disruptors in the deck. Um, and of course, you know, in the three drop slot, we are also running the Mana Mim Fox. Don't need to explain this really. It is, you know, the best Amethyst card in the deck, or Amethyst card in, in the game maybe um, still. Uh, three cost, four, three body with Rush, bounce a card back. So again, same synergy with like bouncing back Ursula Deceiver, replaying it as the Mim Snake, and then being able to out threat if that is uh, something you need to do. Because aggro, while it's good to keep questing, you still need to deal with an opponent's board. And then we have four Diablos, and whoa, that's the wrong Diablo. And the reason is because these, you can notice, like I'm not using too many foils here unless I have to, um, but I don't actually want to bust out my Diablos from my other deck that are double sleeved. So I'm just using these as proxies for now. Uh, but these should be the three cost Diablo. I'll just uh, swing these around here just so you can kind of see them. Um, but yeah, Diablo in uh, Amethyst Emerald is pretty much standard now in any Emerald deck, you will be running Diablo. So it's a little unfortunate given the price of this card. I know it's going to turn a lot of people off from Emerald, but it's why Emerald is one of the best colors in the game now between Ursula Deceiver of all, which this deck doesn't play, um, and the Diablo now being two very, very powerful cards. Um, green is definitely a control color though now. It is probably the most control-oriented color in, in, in the game now, I would say. Um, yeah, just because of how prevalent discard is. Uh, but yeah, Diablo... You need it in this deck, unfortunately. It is your draw engine. It helps supplement your Amethyst draw engines. It's a big threat that your opponent has to deal with. And what's nice about this card that a lot of people don't really realize or talk about, um, from what I've seen, is this card is also a Tempo Disruptor, which sounds crazy, right? You're like, what are you talking about, Quantum? It doesn't, you know, uh, bounce something or make my opponent do something that they don't want to do. Well, it kind of does, because when your opponent sees this come down, um, especially if it's exerted already, that signals to your opponent, like, I have to deal with this. So if they had, like, a Hiram that they wanted to play, maybe they're like, well, I don't play Hiram, now I have to play Brawl on this instead. So it puts them a turn behind to deal with your board, right? Because the Diablo is such a threat like that. And while they're dealing with the Diablo, they're not able to progress their own game state, and therefore whatever you have on board from before is able to quest without being threatened. You know, maybe instead of playing a Maui, they play something to out the Diablo, right? So it just saves your board and enables you to quest even more. So if it survives, great, get the draw engines off. If it doesn't survive, you've likely slowed your opponent down enough hopefully that they've lost some tempo and you're able to continue questing you continue to play four friends on the other side despite playing no ursula deceiver so quite a stark contrast <clears throat> to what we were playing in into the inklands um and this card can be sung with any number of your three drops of course um and the draw two is just still very powerful you don't need the draw four again because you have diablo so you'll be drawing you know one off this two off this potentially uh it's just strong enough in and of itself plus you play like rabbits which we'll get to in a second but between all of that like you don't need the tempo loss with with playing an ursula deceiver of all if that makes sense <clears throat> because you don't really play too much of an extended three song or less package speaking of which to round out our three drop slot we have two mother knows best uh, again just another tempo disrupting card when you need to slow your opponent down if the game does get to a little bit of a grind game you know they start dropping the big threats like the tinkerbells the tamatoas whatever just slowing them down by a turn can help you close a game out and then in the four drop slot Okay, we still play the four rabbits, which again, you can argue what, what's going on here. That's not an aggro oriented card, but you do need to still keep your card, uh, your sorry, your hand healthy with cards. And the rabbit is sticky. The goat is sticky, right? They have in, uh, come into the field effects. They have when they leave the field effects. These cards are a problem to deal with. The goats is definitely something that you will close the game out with a lot as with your mim cards still. So still a relevant strategy. 
uh, two sets after its release from Rise of the Floodborne. But the Rabbit, I think, is still needed in order to continue to draw those threats. Because especially if you do get into the grind game later on, being able to, to play Rabbit, draw a card, and drop a one-drop is still good value. Especially if it's a Cursed Merfolk, because you're demanding your opponent answer multiple things on your board. Otherwise, that is just a lot of questing pressure. And then if they do answer it, it's a, it's a card draw, right? So that's why we still play that package. What's also interesting here is I've opted for three Tinkerbell. And uh, this card is good because not only does it have evasive and a quest for two, which means it's hard for your opponent to out. Yes, it can be brawled, medusa, etc. But it also gives another card evasive when it enters the battlefield. So can you imagine if you know you're playing on curb? Let's say you went first, and then you know you have a turn three play where I don't know you had a mim fox come down on board, right? Then your opponent on turn three shifts the diablo and quests with it. And now you're like, okay, your turn, you draw, you ink your fourth ink, you play this Tinkerbell, you give your Mim Fox evasive and you throw it into the opposing Diablo, right? Like that's some of the interaction that you can get off of uh, the Tinkerbell here. Very, very strong in order to deal with opposing evasives, mainly the opposing Diablo that you might see on Emerald Steel. So you can see that, you know, despite this card, no, this deck, sorry, having some bad matchups into Steel, you still have good counterplay options. To round out the four slot, we've got three Queen's Castle. So again, this is a card that is representative of card draw and lore gain. It's one of the strongest cards in the format for sure. When I say Mim Fox is probably the best Amethyst card, the Queen's Castle might be up there too, tied for the, one of the best cards in the game, let alone one of the best Amethyst cards as well. Uh, this card just represents a lot of pressure. Very few things can answer this in one shot, not even the Maui can. Uh, your opponent needs multiple threats on board in order to throw into this. That being said, there is a time and a place to play this. Um, when you need the card draw, yes, it's good to play it, but you don't want to play it if your opponent has a wide board that they can just out it right away. Um, you need to clean up their board a little bit if possible, or you just ink this and continue questing through their board if you can do that, right? So while it is a good card in this aggro strategy, that's why we're not playing four like you would see in like Ruby Amethyst, for example. Like I mentioned in the beginning, in the uh, five drop slot, we are playing the Shift Pegasus with the smaller Pegasus, where in this deck, you get the maximum value compared to the Emerald Steel deck because you are planning to load up the board with a bunch of characters to continue questing. This card, in combination with any of your, like, you know, two questing bodies represents insane value because unless your opponent can answer it without challenging, assuming they don't have evasives to challenge, like, you're just going to end up doubling up on your lore, right? They need to, like, be prepared, wipe your board, grab your swords, wipe your board, you know, drop uh, Medusas to wipe things out, like... It's very, very strong. And then, you know, in isolation, it's still a two-questing body for five, so it's not necessarily the worst either. Yes, it does get outed by Medusa, but the shift line is just very valuable. And then the final card we'll take a look at in this deck is the Ursula Sea Witch Queen. This card being able to shift onto the smaller Ursula is very relevant because not only does it represent a two-lore swing on the quest, but it also will force an exertion of an opposing, opposing character and stop the singing of all songs from both you and your opponent, except for if you want to sing, you yourself want to sing with this Ursula, which you probably won't do. Like, it's better to quest with this than sing something like Friends or A Mother Knows Best, right? Um, but this is a very strong finishing option because it's a huge stat line. It's very hard to out. It quests for three. It has very powerful effects. It stops some of the potential end game from your opponent. Again, doing something to help combat or give you some counterplay against the Amber Steel song decks where they can't sing their songs anymore. They're going to be forced to hard cast them. And then this card forcing exertions can help you clean up the opponent's boards if you are getting threatened for game or something, like throwing your, your Mim Fox into something that the Ursula exerts can be very strong. And the fact that this comes out on five on shift is very relevant. Most of the time, if you see it early, it will be ink. But in certain scenarios, this card can just lock up the game for you and easily take the victory. So that is my profile for Emerald Amethyst. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I uh, will be hopefully giving you some matches with this deck. Uh, let me know what you want to see next. Thank you again for watching. If you've made it this far, Quantum is out.